well, we have our constant, we have add, and a couple other operators that are worth exploring are ramp. You can see that ramp is nothing more than a gradient that we can get through colors. It's black to white by default, but you can just select one of these two and start to tweak them. So maybe I don't want to go from black to white, maybe I want to add something like green. And as I mix the hue, well, as I select the hue and add the saturation or mix the value, I'm going to get a different effect. And maybe instead of black, I want to go from, let's go from maybe something like red to green. Yeah, maybe that's too bright. And let's really saturate it. So sure, that's one way to do it, but I don't quite like this ramp. So maybe I want to throw something in the middle of it. Maybe I want to go through more of a cyan color, maybe turquoise, and I'm going to be mixing this. And you can keep adding points to the ramp. You can go towards, uh, well, you can go towards grayscale if you remove the saturation. Well, it can be either great or if you remove saturation and add value, you're going to get to lighter colors. Um, you can keep adding different colors to it. And you can either come up with really nice looking or really complicated ramps that are that you're going to be able to you're going to be able to use in your compositions. Um, and well, ramp happens to be quite the quite a complicated uh, operator. Well, not really complicated. It it's a very is a very useful operator, not just for the color that it brings, but just utility. For example, in this case. I have my ramp, which is horizontal, but what if I want a vertical ramp? It certainly allows me to do that. N not just that, but I have a radial setting and a circular setting. So just by changing the type of ramp, I can get these different effects, which are very useful. Um, not only that, but I can also use my ramps in very creative ways. For example, if I select my original ramp, black to white, I can select what happens if I change the face, which is nothing more than where I start my ramp. You can see that if I start at zero, my ramp is it's at, the, at its start. If I move it left or right, I'm going to get a different starting point for my ramp. If I set the period, I can make it last longer, which effectively pushes it out of my viewer, or I can make it shorter. And remember that this is basically a fraction. So by setting it to 0.25, I'm just making it repeat itself four times. I can handle it. I can, I can handle how it repeats itself or what it does after it exceeds its first period. For example, if I wanted to extend, to extend left, it will repeat or right. It's handling it the same as left, but maybe I don't want to repeat it. Maybe I want to just hold whatever color it as it reaches it. So I just have white here. Let's just change it to blue just to make a point. Sure. That's a blue. Maybe instead of holding it, I want to set it to black. So as soon as I hit the end of ramp, it goes back to black. Maybe uh, zero means like black and alpha zero, to totally translucent. So that's zero across all channels. Repeat was the original one, but I could also do mirror, which creates this nice and smooth ramp for me to use. So let's do this. Let's duplicate. Well, we have this once and we can duplicate this ramp so I can just leave at repeat. Again, we're going to have an example pack to explore this. So that that might give you a better idea of how um, of how to use ramps and uh, one of the best uses of ramps happens to be that it can serve well just like if you were painting something you can use ramps as your color palette like wh whenever you're doing you know, you're creating composition for example let's go back to my movie file in and i'm gonna add that movie that we were using in this case, this movie, we can see that it has sort of a gradient. I have black, well, I have white 
and grace in between, it's itself kind of a ramp. So that's a there's a very useful operator that would allow me to integrate this top with the ramps that I have around here. So this one's called the lookup top. If I connect this movie to the lookup top, that right now is just warning me that there's no second input, and I'm going to integrate it with a ramp. I add the ramp to it and nothing's happening, but at least I don't have there anymore. What's going on here is that movie file in is using the darkest colors to look up the colors over here on the left side of my ramp and the brightest colors on the right side of my ramp. And you're going to see this because I can replace this color, which maybe let's use something. Let's make this quite cool, a cool something between gray and blue. So I have this ramp and I'm going to add a dark blue here, quite saturated. And as you can see, let's, this is worth taking a closer look. I can see that I'm replacing all the original black from my movie. In fact, let's do this. The original black from my movie with this dark blue and as it gets brighter I am getting I am getting the well the the sign color that I selected again I'm not stuck with between the colors I can just keep adding colors and uh, maybe I'm gonna go for something more purplish in the middle and you can see that it changes my my whole output whenever I use a network I like to add a final null just as a final product so that's useful and that's definitely worth keeping an eye on. The, the, this is lookup and ramps are very powerful together. In fact, they're so powerful that you can you can use, let's say, a ramp. If you have some sort of ramp that you like and that you're naturally getting from one place, you can definitely keep it and well, you can put it together and mix different types of ramps. What if I have these, um, let's say, this radial ramp, or well, more of a circular ramp, and I like, well, I wanna hold the, the well, let's make it the furthest color and I get sort of this circular pattern, but I'm getting this ramp, well, I'm getting this pattern from some other image or, or something else, and I know that I wanna replace these colors, by mixing ramp together, oh, and it seems like we have a bit of a bug here. Cool. Um, by mixing these colors together, you can get some interesting results. Like in this case, maybe a bit of, uh, let's do red. And we can go all the way to yellow. And we can get something like this. And similarly, I can keep adding colors to this and maybe let's add something a bit more interesting. Something of this sort. Yeah, that kind of works. There we go. So I have different types of ramps that I can work with. Uh, keep an eye on our networks. Remember how colors work. RGB, hue, saturation, value, and ramps that you can use to look up different colors. And you're going to be able to mix and match your networks to your liking. Well, this is kind of an awful ramp, but it kind of makes an example. I'll make sure to include a better one in the example pack. So that kind of covers color except for this one other one that well there's another operator that might come in handy it's quite simple and it's the monochrome whenever we have monochrome all it does is take um, well any color operator and it turns it into black and white it's great if you're not particularly interested in the colors of the image or a movie and you just want brightness it's a great way to integrate this with uh, with different types of network or, or if you're trying to do something fun with the brightness of a picture or an incoming image that pretty much covers everything that has to do with color. 
let's move on to some other generators that we have in Touch Designer. Now that we're more comfortable with a few of these operators, it might be a good chance to start checking out a few of our generators in texture operators. So circle is a very common one. It's as simple as it gets really. Our circle can allow us to change the radius, like it can be horizontal or vertical. If it's not a perfect circle, you're gonna be able to rotate it. I mean, technically you are rotating it as if it's a perfect circle, you're just not gonna be able to notice. And you can use the center. I'm gonna reset the radius. You're gonna change the center to translate or to move your circle around. That's quite useful. And you can assign colors like just like in any of the other of the other objects that we've seen before. Just keep an eye on other parameters that might be tied to them. I just added a color for the border, but I don't see anything. That's because our border width is that is set to zero. Similarly, if I change the background color, say to red, I'm not gonna see anything because my background alpha is set to zero. So yeah, now I have, um, I have a circle right here, a simple, very simple composition. Uh, maybe I don't quite like this because it's been, you know, maybe too simple. So I'm going to add some softness to it and it gives it some, a little bit of blur. It's one way to, it's one way to come up with interesting, interesting results. Then you can keep using the circle if you want to create maybe a bigger composition or maybe if you're animating something like a logo or a minimal type of design, this is this is a way to get started with it. Let's add another circle. And since this is a very simple shape with simple parameters that we can use, this is a good time to start talking about another type of operator, which are chops. Chops or channel operators are how we are gonna use data, which we can then use in our texture operators or the other type of objects that we have in Touch Designer. The first one we're going to check is something that we have seen before as a top, which is the constant. But in the case of chops, the constant allows us to directly plug numbers into our system. Let use, let's use a null as well. You can see that there's some overlap. Nulls are also going to help us keep our networks organized. So the way we add constant to our networks is by simply giving a channel a name and we're going to call it maybe radius X and we're going to add another one that's called radius Y. And this is what I mean by channels. The data in these chops are, are sent via a single channel. So if I'm using something like radius X, and I change its value, it's gonna have no effect on radius Y. So it's important to keep those independent channels and to be able to manipulate them independently. Mostly because I want to be able to work with them separately. You could find creative ways to do otherwise. Now I want to be able to manipulate the, this, well, to use these numbers and to plug them into our texture operator, but it's not like I can just drag this and put them on top. Like I have to find a way to directly send the channels to the texture operators. And to do that, the easiest way to, to send these values is by doing what we call an export. We're simply gonna activate the viewer. We're gonna select our top and we're gonna drag the channel that we want to tie to the para to our parameter and drop it on top. You have different ways of tying it. We're going to talk about the other ones later, but export chop is a good way to tie this channel. Now the circle's gone, we're going to see why. And remember that the viewer needs to be active for for us to do that. Otherwise, you're just going to move the operator. So activate the viewer, make sure you've selected the right top and tie the parameters together. And here's where it gets fun because now I can use radius X and radius Y. Remember that they both need to have a value. Otherwise I'm not going to be able to see my circle and you can start to control your circle from outside the top. This is a good way to start thinking about maybe I want to 
develop a user interface or have some sort of control for a circle on screen. It could be quite a quite of an interesting visual toy or or some sort of a interesting design, interactive design. Maybe another channel that I'd like to play around with is border width. And I know that my circles have a border. So I have the border width right here. And I'm going to press A because that's the shortcut that allows me to toggle the viewer. And I'm going to tie this to border width. Again, this is going to have a noticeable effect. You can see that one is quite drastic. So maybe I'll want to stick to smaller values in this case. And maybe. Yeah, something like this is good. And finally, um, let's do something like the border alpha, where the alpha works. Similarly, I select, I look for my border alpha, tie it to the parameter, and there we go. Border alpha is zero, and yeah, maybe something subtle like this makes it a bit more elegant and let's add some softness might as well that's pretty good you can see that well black might not be the best uh, best option to highlight the border that we're using right now so maybe use let's use a light color there there you go something like this and that's a pretty useful way to get started with chops, but chops can get a lot more exciting than this. If we add another circle and just some utility stuff, uh, let's maybe bring this closer to here. If you double click and open up your create dialog, you can navigate the different types of operators using tap and shift tap to go back. Just hotkeys are always worth exploring. And in this case, I'm going to use a tiny circle, something, yeah, something smaller than that. And what I'm going to try to do is perhaps animate this circle somehow. Remember that we talked that Touch Designer, well, Touch Designer is a great framework if you want to work in real time. It's, it's going to make things real easy for you. So one of the ways that you're going to do this is by using an LFO. As you can see, unlike the constant, which is just set at all times, LFOs move as time goes by. And remember, if I pause it, it's going to freeze everything. So keep an eye on the timing part of Touch Designer. Again, I add my null. Maybe this one would be worth naming, like an LFO or something like that. I always use the the n as a as, as a Pre, well, I always prepend it to whatever name I do. That way I will remember that it's a null le later on. And well, this is going to be interesting because now I have a value. An LFO, if any of you have used music, I ha and I have made music in general, um, I have a value between 1 and negative 1. So it's effectively like a music LFO in synthesis. It's a very common concept. So it's going up and down. And I can definitely use it for my circle, particularly if I want to maybe move the center. So let's tie that channel. And I think perhaps we should rename that channel to X because whenever we were, whenever we're talking about a horizontal 2D context, X is going to be a horizontal axis and Y is going to be a vertical axis. And so let's tie this to our center. We set it to export and you know that's good but it's not quite what I wanted to do that's a bit too drastic so let's explore another another one that's called math math operators allow us to perhaps limit this like we we can maybe I don't want it to go from negative one to one so I have different options to do this we're gonna ignore this first tab first and I'm gonna multiply this well from negative one to one is too big Maybe let's do something like 0.25. That's pretty subtle. It's a pretty nice motion of it. Um, I could potentially add a second LFO. There are different ways to do this on the same LFO, but I'm not going to worry about it for now. 
I'm gonna add a second LFO and set the channel to Y. Um, I'm gonna do this sign, well, the sign oscillator. But now I wanna send both to the system that I have here. In this case, there's a useful chop that allows me to merge different signals. And well, it's called just that, merge. So now I have both channels in here. Naturally, my Y channel is not really doing much, so I need to I need to tie it by activating the viewer and set a, selling export chop. And this can be quite fun because my LFOs are not particularly in sync, but if I set them to sync, I'm gonna get this diagonal motion. Maybe I can just keep pulsing. If I can keep pulsing this LFO, and I'm gonna get different types of motion patterns. I can change the frequency of this one and I'm going to start to get a different type of animation from the circle. So this is this is a fun thing in Touch Designer as well. Now if I want to see over time and this is something that might help you plan things a little bit. If you want to see how your LFO is moving over time or for that matter just about any other chop, the trail chop allows you to to view this movement as the timeline goes by. If I want to see both channels, all I have to do is connect them after the merge. And you can see that there's like the different period makes it the so that there's a slight difference, which results in this fun and oscillating pattern in the circle. So that's a good way to do it. And Finally, let's say, well, we're speaking about time, but I haven't really been using this timeline. So let's come up with something else to do. We're gonna, we're gonna add our circle here. And there's another chop that is useful for this type of thing. We're gonna go for like a timeline, yeah, timeline chop. And what this timeline does, I'm just gonna start turning on all of its channels. This timeline contains a lot of useful information regarding the timing and the the let's say the progress of your of your sketch. So we want to make sure that we select whatever we need. In this case, I'm just going to use the frames. If you haven't heard the term the term frame, frame is simply every single image that well, touch designer shows you one image after another, just like you would see in any sort of film or animation, one image after another at the frame rate that you wish to see it. So frame is simply one image, one instant of your animation. And you're, it's going to be shown at, let's say in this case, we have FPS 60, just as indicated here or in our timeline. And um, that's the rate that we're going to be able to see our, well, at the rate at which our animation progresses. As you can see, our animation lasts 600 frames. This is end and this indicator end because I could just select part of it. But for now, that's all we care about. And we're going to select our frame and we're going to select our end because we know that our animation has 600 frames as an end. And we're going to notice that our progress keeps going until it reaches 600. Now, what I want to do is to take advantage of this timeline to create some animation in the circle. And here's what's going to happen. I'm going to simply use my, well, let's say something like my math operator. And this is another way to use this operator. I'm trying to maybe you do something with both channels and I'm going to combine them. And what I want to do is divide them by dividing them the well by dividing the frame by the end, I've effectively created a counter that goes from zero to one and it tracks the progress of my animation. The reason why zero to one is such a common range is because you can scale it just to just about anything where zero is nothing and one is your top your maximum value. So if I want to tie this to the radius, 
0 means that there's no circle and 1 means my, my maximum radius. If I want to tie this to brightness, 0 is totally dark, 1 is to brightness. And this works regardless of what parameter you're using. Maybe I want to use radius, I might not want to go above 0 0.5. If I want to go with color, I'm probably going to be using 0 to 1, although there are some other places where it might be convenient to change this. Border width, I might want to go 0 to 0.035 or something like that. So it's a very it, it's something that's very easy to scale. In this case, maybe I'm going to want to reset all parameters. Um, maybe that's all I need for the math and I'm gonna tie this to yeah we can I could easily tie this to the radius and I'm gonna get a fun effect let's see yeah it's pretty good but maybe I don't want it to go overboard so you can always after I've selected what to do with my co channel combination, I could scale this down to half. Or you know what? Maybe seven seven zero seven. That should result in the corner. There we go. As soon as it hits a corner, it goes back to zero. So math overall is great whenever you want to add stuff together. Whenever you want to modify the values of your chops of your channels. Um, this is great if you're trying to well either combine different chops or combine different channels so it's very useful and um, it's it's definitely worth checking out definitely experiment with this ones now that we've checked out circle let's move on to another one of this and um, let's say if I don't want to use a circle for any of this and I'm gonna get rid of all of this let's say rectangle is another generator which I could use for this type of system same drill rectangle has a size it's got to be more obvious when you rotate it in fact um, I could create this type of thing I'm gonna add my well I'm gonna export the channels from my LFOs in a similar similar way and I'm gonna do a bit of a smaller rectangle let's add some color maybe cool and well in this case I could just add a third LFO and I'm just gonna call it rotate and I'm gonna use this one to rotate our rectangle now here's the deal I can barely see this because as I had mentioned before whenever we're rotating something um, we want to make sure that we're thinking of larger values because we're talking about angles so this might be a good time to add a math before we merge our values so here we have something like well this one's getting processed by this one and I know it's getting getting scaled down I'm just gonna scale it right back up so let's do 180 whoop and too much there we go and we get a something a bit more drastic um, 360 is gonna be a, a bit more out of control but it works again we're sending we're scaling this LFO here and then we're sending it to a merge which is gonna rescale it so perhaps I would reconsider this setup maybe I would find a way to scale these two first and then merge them always think about the flow in your networks right now it's not really important no, I'm just showing you how this works so so it's a good way to do this maybe I don't want my rectangle to be well to have sharp edges that's um, you know that there's always the chance to change the corner radius and you can see that this rectangle has a bit of a softer border has like no no angle on the on the on the corners so that's 
that's really useful. And you can also change the softness on this, which is great if you're working at low resolution. The rotation might be a bit too wild, so let's bring that frequency down. Well, actually, let's bring that frequency quite low. And we have some nicer motion there. So that's for rectangles. Um, rectangles are really, they're, they're very similar to symbols, to circles, and um, it should be quite easy to, it should be quite easy to integrate into your compositions. Now we're gonna, well, I'm gonna get rid of all this, and we're gonna, we're gonna explore another, well, we're gonna explore circles, but for a different type of application. We're gonna go back to our circle top. And um, although we've explored it to a certain extent, this circle has an additional purpose. If you enable the polygon option on the panel, it turns your circle into a polygon. And you can change how many sides you wanna have with a minimum of three. Although it might seem like an odd place to have a polygon because, well, it is a circle top after all. If you think about it, it makes sense because the more sides you add to it, the closer you get to a circle. In fact, you could argue that our polygon, well, our circle is nothing more than a polygon with infinite sides in this case. So let's bring them back down and I'm just going to go for, um, triangle. Um, this case, I could rotate it to 90 degrees to have sort of a, the classical equilateral triangle. And I'm going to bring it down maybe points 0 0.075. That kind of leaves it in a place where I want to work with it. And maybe let's, let's explore a different chop to see what we can do with it. And one that I personally like a lot is the trigger chop. We're just going to add it here. We're going to add our no. And the way trigger works is by pulsing and creating a curve. In fact, let's maybe add an operator, which we've already explored the trail curve. And we can see how it progresses over time. If you've ever done a bit of, well, if you've ever made music, the way these curves go, it's a lot like an envelope, um, or you can think about it as a line that goes over time. And what happens is that as soon as you get a trigger, and maybe let's do something like this. As soon as you get a trigger, the trigger starts the curve, which eventually goes down and is sustained at a certain level until it's eventually released. These stages are called the attack, decay, sustain, and release. And on this, well, on this axis, we're basically talking about time. And sorry about my handwriting, but it's hard to draw on the board this way. So we have the trigger which sets forth the whole curve until we get another trigger, which starts the whole thing again. What we're doing in this trigger is basically setting up this curve, which we can have either a quick attack or we can have maybe something longer. You can see how it lasts longer we, we could have it be instantaneous or perhaps, well, if we go to the sustain tab, we can change the other stages, which is decay. Right now, we can see that we just go up right away and there's a bit of a decay. And maybe we want to have a long sustain. So let's do one second. and we can definitely play with that shape. Now let's see what we can do to tie this to our triangle in this case, which this is gonna be much more appropriate. 
and maybe what I want to do is tie to a uh, color fill. And we could also do something like, uh, where do I want to, yeah, maybe the border width. Let's see how it goes. Oh, that's right. The border width has a different, let's do this. We're going to add a math here and we're going to add a second null. So this is an interesting case in which I might want to use a simple trigger to control two, two parameters. I was expecting the color to change, but the border is not really letting me see it. So we can use the math to scale this trigger without affecting our what's going to be what effectively is going to be our color and in this case it would make a good argument to rename the nulls to n color and maybe n border width and what we want to do here is perhaps instead of scaling it you know what i want to go i don't want to have no border at any point so i'm just going to set the minimum range to 0.02 and I'm going to go all the way up to 0 0.04. So what's going to happen, math, this is another application of math, which instead of scaling or adding or anything, I'm just going from 0 to 1, which is my ramp, and I'm turning that range from 0 0.02 to 0 0.04. Just a different range. Um, it's effectively a different type of scaling. And let's type the parameter up to my border width which was tied to the other one, but now is on the right one. And let's see what it does. And I can see the color changing. Now it's going straight for, for this white, well, the white fill to a dark border, which gets a bit thicker as the curve goes by. Maybe 0 0.04 is a bit well, not not noticeable enough. Let's see. Yeah, that's much more noticeable. This might be interesting. If it reminds you of a button getting pressed or something, perhaps this is something that you might want to experiment with if you're creating your own user interface and you want to create so, sort of a button that you can press over with triggers and a triangle or maybe a circle or a rectangle. This is definitely a way to do it. And the, that's the power of the trigger chop. It can give you variation over time and it's gonna allow you to, it's gonna allow you to control different parameters whichever way you wanna set it up. Um, another useful one, and maybe let's set up our circle. And well, let's do something fun with this one. Remember that I that, that I mentioned that Touch Designer is great whenever you want to throw in some interactivity? Well, our keyboard can help us there. If we have a keyboard in, it's a great way to start thinking about how to integrate our keyboard with Touch Designer. If I press, if I click, well, if I type the key 1, it tells me when the key is down. And if you check the panel, you can see, well, anywhere from like when you want it to be active, like it'll only be active while I'm clicking, while I'm clicking it basically, but I can select which key I want to show. Like what if I don't want to use one, but I want to use the letter J. Okay. It's going to give me whenever I press one and J and you can see that it's starting to list different things and it's going to create channels for me, which is really convenient. One, J, two, and whatever it is I need. For now, I'm going to go with just one. You can so you can use modifier modifier keys if you want to. In this case, it's not really a good idea. And you can and you can tie this to different panels, but we're not going to go into that right now. Um, now, what I want to do with keyboard in is perhaps trigger something on my circle which it could be something as simple as, well, maybe let's start 
at a rectangle or a pentagon and then we keep going up and we're going to try to do something fun with it so there's another chop that could allow me to do something of the sort we're going to add a count and the way this count chop works is that every time it gets um, an input it starts to count up I can clear the count whenever I want but in general I could just use it to keep counting up forward and forward this is great because I can just set it up in such a way that I can set the sides of the circle however zero again is not really a useful range for me to work with so I could use math and multiply it or maybe change the range of it but then I'm gonna have a problem that I'm just gonna get to too many sides in fact maybe let's get started with that eventually it's just not gonna make a difference you can see that it just becomes a circle and it does nothing for us so I'm gonna clear the count we don't have our circle and I'm gonna introduce another chop which is called limit and the limit chop might give me a bit more control over what I want to do in this case I'm gonna let's well if I clamp it it's gonna get to well let's limit between 3 and 5 so if I clamp this it ignores any limit I anything I get below the limit of 3 it's gonna start adding until I get to 5 and then ignores everything else which is not as fun but at least it's we're getting somewhere but the one I want to use is loop now loop and instead of minimum 3 I'm gonna go up the maximum of all the way to 12 and let's see what we can do with it now every time I type my key 1 it keeps adding one side and after I get to 12 it resets well after I would get to 12 it resets everything back to 3 if I actually want to be able to get to the number 12 I should set my my maximum level to 13 it's not an inclusive number apparently so that's yeah that's a useful way to start messing around with our circle fun thing that we could do maybe I don't want to use a chop to rotate the circle and um, this is a good way to start thinking about global options and and different commands that touch designer puts at my our disposal I don't really need to set up a whole a uh, whole chop to control time for example what I want to do as you can see if I click on my parameters I'm gonna see different options the one where I'm in right now is just an expression in which I could set 90 or well it's a constant 90 uh, 45 and it'll give me the angle I want and if I set this to expression I could do things such as 45 plus 45 and I can keep adding the angle plus 180 and it's gonna do the math for me but there are variables if you if you have some basic skills program in programming which are simply values that touch the side is holding for us and one of this is called apps time dot second which is effectively giving me how many seconds touch designer has been running for which is slowly rotating our circle that's fun but not useful yet maybe let's multiply it by 10 and we're getting somewhere maybe 25 could be a better number and that's better another variable that we could use and could uh, could perhaps be more appropriate for uh, for angles it's up up time dot frame which gives us the current frame whenever we're talking about absolute time we're not talking about the timeline but we're talking about the time that touch designer has been running for so you can see that we're getting some way larger numbers 
and that's pretty useful and ways to start having fun with touch designer uh, so so far we've reviewed a few tops we've reviewed chops and th these have been really useful tools but for now we don't really have a way well we've mostly done things with tops on their own we haven't really put any of them together so we've created no compositions we're gonna talk about compositing and we're going to see how we can start mixing things in Touch Designer. Whenever we talk about compositing, we're putting on different shapes, different figures, different textures, and even you can think of it as layers together. So we have something like our, let's say our rectangle, and we also have our circle. Now, we need, we need a way to put them both together. And in this case, we might have a bit of a larger circle and we can create contrast with colors. So maybe some light color and something darker, maybe a bit darker and let's change it a little bit. Cool. So what do we do by compositing is finding different ways to combine these images to put them together and the easiest way would be adding them together to do that we have the add top and whenever you use the following tops that we're going to be using for compositing we simply are adding them together and well this was kind of challenging to see because the colors are quite creating a lot of brightness but the more we change the colors, we can find that certain colors work with each other or they work against one another, particularly as you change different saturation values as, as you play with the red, green, and blue. Uh, in this case, you might even get away with like using something like, well, maybe not quite white, but like something gray and you can end up with something way brighter because the brightness of the rectangle is getting added to the one of the circle. So that's one way to think of it. Something that might help, well, highlight this difference might be the use of the text top, which effectively is just a, well, just a top that uses text instead of a figure of any sort and we can use it to well we we're going to replace the default derivative text or make let's maybe use color and you can change the font size as well um, by using something larger maybe yeah something like that works let's select a color as simple as well something light blue and we can use another another compositing well first of all let's use a rectangle and we're gonna make it a larger one and another one that we have is the difference and funny enough difference is gonna highlight the difference that our that our texture textures have in this case we're kind of subtracting color from a rectangle but at the same time we also have this border around the rectangle this empty part that seems to be highlighted by difference so that's another way to composite it if we copy well if we copy these two together set a different color and um, let's do well we, we can use this white rectangle as well and we're going to multiply this multiplying is another way to composite but in this case we're not seeing much and the reason why this happens is that whenever we multiply it's almost applying a we're almost applying a mask on top of the texture in this case if our rectangle were smaller we're going to start to see that it starts to crop our text. So it's one thing to keep in mind. Maybe let's do 0.5 and we're going to rotate 90 degrees. Uh, whoops, 45 degrees. 
and it starts to get more interesting, right? So that's that's another way to comp. And um, we can also use movie file well, or well images. And well, you know what? Maybe let's use that banana icon and a constant. We're gonna set a color such as, um, yeah, purple. And we're gonna set one over the other. Now we find something interesting. We have different aspect ratios in the images. These, well, all the compositing textures, so all the compositing tops are gonna allow us to select which input sets the aspect ratio. In this case, we have input one, which preserves the banana icon and it looks good with the constant in the back simply, or input two, which kind of stretches things out, but it could be useful if you, if you are, if you have a need to keep the square aspect ratio of the constant. Let's set it as well over input one and that works for us. Another one that we might want to think of is, let's copy the text here as well. And we're going to set this to red. And we're going to select sub, which is a subtraction. And what we're going to do, you know what, let's reverse this. We're we have our original rectangle and we're simply subtracting red from our white color. And if you remember, we had red, green, and blue. All we, all that remains is the green and blue together. So that's an example of subtraction. We're effectively subtracting this from the original top. And finally, well, these are just a few of these. But the, the one that we really care about, and let's maybe select two other things, like we haven't really created a scene with, um, with, our, with our tops. So maybe let's add this little, this little figure here, and we're gonna add another one. And we're gonna create, um, we're gonna use our cloudy ocean image. And the well, the top that we that we're really going to be focused on is compositing. And the reason why is because composite not only includes all the other tops that we've seen so far, and the compositing tops at least, but it it gives you a few extra options. Like in this case, by default, it multiplies our comp, and we can also add it. We can set it atop of the other, which is similar to over. We can negate or we can select the maximum color, the minimum one. We could do sort of a stencil luminance or soft light, different types of compositing. So depending on what you're trying to do, you might find different compositing techniques to be appropriate. Definitely test them out. And if you were not quite sure of what you want to use, a good way to do this is to enable the preview grid, which is going to highlight all the possible combinations that you get between one another. Not only that, but for different ones, it's going to tell you what happens if you reverse the inputs. So this preview grid is really useful. Make sure you turn it on if you want to experiment with it. That's with compositing. Um, give it a try. Add multiple figures, start joining them together, start putting them on top of each other, and it, it's the best way to start creating your own art, your own designs. Just to start wrapping up tops, we're going to talk about one final thing, and that is noise. If you're familiar with, let's select this pattern random our random pattern if you've ever made any sort of art in images or in creative coding you know that randomness is 
very well it's a very useful thing to have because it adds on predictability to whatever it is you're trying to do so whatever parameter you would want to check maybe you're controlling position or the size of a figure randomness can be great to add some excitement to your to your project however sometimes this is too hectic and it's not something you it's not the best choice so that's where noise kicks in our noise chop gives us some randomness but it's much more smooth it's much more controlled and you can select how smooth you want it to be it can be really controlled you can really have a smooth uh, ups and downs that will allow you to to create control randomness in fact if you go to common you can enable time slice and what this noise is doing is going over the curve and creating this well it's effectively reading it as we had our LFO and this can be really useful if we're planning to perhaps drive one our a rectangle or our circles just like we were doing before but instead of having a set LFO we can have some variance with it we're going to just use the same channel to drive both of our radius and the cool thing well right now we have our circle disappearing and doing some weird stuff the way to fix that is by selecting our noise and we're going to set an offset which is a constant value so we're never going to go below 0.5 but now our amplitude's too much, so maybe we want to go for something like 0.25. Yeah, you know what? Let's bring the offset to 0.25 and this one to 5. A bit of a larger variation, and that works for us. Effectively, what's happening is that the amplitude sets the variation. It goes above and below 0.25, so we might hit below zero sometimes but it's and at this point it would be a rare effect that we might be interested in we can select different types of noise so maybe hermite or brownian yeah test different things it's the best way to get used to noise it's like randomness but we have that driving our circle and in this case we have noise in one dimension it's just going on and we have effectively a list of values if you want to take a closer look at this list you can always enable the viewer the viewer and we can enable dots per sample you're going to be able to see that these are nothing more than values that change over time moving on to 2d noise um, our tops have the noise that well it's really it's a really convenient way to come up with per variation patterns that can be drastically different from one another and that can add a lot of uh, flavor to your textures so let's use noise and maybe create a pattern we're gonna do a little bit of lower period and you can see that this looks a lot like if you've ever seen any overhead pictures and all this is effectively considered to be something like a terrain or something like when you see a picture from think of maybe a picture of the moon or picture of a, of a mountain range from you know from overhead so that's exactly what noise does for us it does some natural those natural mounts and valleys that we get from the 1d noise but in two dimensions going on x and y dimension so on the x and y axis and the convenient thing about this noise and transforms which we can also find on the on the chop is that it can allow us to animate this noise Re if we remember our apps time dot second we're gonna be able to whoops uh, seconds we're gonna be able to animate this but perhaps it's a bit too sudden so I'm gonna 
multiply this by 0 0.1 and you can see that this is much more controlled and much more subtle it's I can probably work with this a lot better and let's just use um let's recycle one of our tricks um